Well, we've been working our way through the foundational scriptures, the bedrock beliefs uh, of our church. And uh, just want to say, if, if you're new and weren't around uh, a couple of years ago when we built this facility, we literally embedded some rocks with scriptures on them in the foundation of our building here. Um, some 15, and then there was a 16th one that was added by Marcia Stevens on the day of the dedication. And the previous two weeks, we talked about context themes, the context out of which we do ministry, where the vision um, has come from, how it unfolds, and how God really is the author of that, and God's timing rules. We looked at the verse from Habakkuk that talks about, though it tarries, wait for it. And that sometimes, as we are marching along on our journey, we have delays and detours, and oftentimes we don't understand them, we find them frustrating and aggravating. Uh, but once we get through and we look back, we know that God, uh, what do they say, is rarely early, but always on time. And we ended last time with the verse from Philippians 1, uh, verse 6. The one who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. That there is one at work in you, in each one of you, doing a work that that one alone can do, sometimes with your cooperation, and sometimes without your cooperation. And as we begin to perceive what it is that God is calling us to be and to do, and most of the time, I'm figuring out, it involves more getting out of the way than doing anything else. And that's easier said than done. That God wants to bring situations and circumstances into our lives that shape us, that mold us, that mature us, that sharpen us, and sometimes that mellow us. Some of us need a little mellowing once in a while, amen? Mm -hmm. This week, we're going to move into promises that are tied to guidance and direction, because as people are called together on a journey, each of our lives, relationships, families, organizations, there's this journey that's being guided, that's being orchestrated. And the verse from Isaiah was another one that um, one of our early deacons, Deacon Ernest, gave back in May of 2001. And when he gave it, um, I'm not going to say I was terribly thrilled. And I will lead the blind by a way they do not know. How many of you like to leave, go somewhere without map, GPS, any idea? How many of you like to just go out not knowing where you're going? I don't. <laughs> I want to know the end from the beginning. I want to do a dry run if I get a chance. I want a map. I want directions. I want a GPS talking to me in plain English. I will lead the blind by a way they do not know. In paths they do not know, I will guide them. Now, doesn't that sound counterintuitive? I will make darkness, now I like this part, into light before them, and rugged places into plains. These are the things I will do, says God, and I will not leave them undone. Well, I thought about that for a while, and then we started overlaying some of the other ones, like Philippians, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And faithful is God who calls us, and God will bring it to pass, and all things are possible to those who believe. I started thinking about how much God wants to lead us. How much God really wants our lives to work, even more than we do. That God wants our lives to make sense. God wants our lives to be fruitful. God wants our lives to be joyful. Jesus said the thief comes to rob and kill and destroy, but I've come to give you life and give it more abundantly. That God really does want to be part of our conversations. God wants to be part of your thought life. God wants to be part of your relationships everywhere, not just intimate 
relationships, but your friendships, your neighborhood relationships. God wants to be part of your decisions. God wants to be an integral part, not an afterthought. And God wants to be with you in times of smooth sailing and in times of turbulence and upheaval. Most times, however, when things are going well and, and everything's coming up roses, you know, God's somewhere on the back burner, you know, back there, and boy, when we hit a mess, God, where are you? But you'll find only as you submit in good times and bad do our lives work. And then we begin to find what Paul called the peace that passes all understanding. But too often we want to do our own thing. And I think as Americans, most of us, we might have a few Canadians here, we pride ourselves on being self-reliant, self-sufficient, independent. And when we come into the body of Christ and we get off the throne of our lives, we put Christ there. It takes us a while to unlearn. To unlearn some of the things like God wants to be in the driver's seat of our lives. And you know what? God doesn't need a backseat driver or a side seat driver. Doesn't need any puny directions from us. I taught my daughter Amanda to drive. Before I taught her to drive, she thought I was a wonderful driver and never complained. After she learned to drive, she'd sit there. Most of the time, she'd be like, Bob, it's 45 miles an hour, you're only going 20. <laughs> what would happen is I'd start telling a story, and the more of the story I tell, the slower I drive. <laughs> One day a school bus passed me. It's true. <laughs> I haven't lived that down yet. <laughs> you know, little kids, you, how much farther are we there yet? And we sort of do that, I think, sometimes with God. When God is trying to lead us um, into places where real growth and maturation can happen in our life. I, Isaiah says, for God, there's a subject in prayer here. God says, I will lead. I will lead the blind. Now, the blind doesn't mean not sighted necessarily. It means those with very limited vision. Here we are stumbling along in our lives. And here's one in whose image we are created and called good. Who knows the end from the beginning. One who knows what's around the next turn. Who knows what curves and potholes are ahead, understands the bends and the forks of the road, knows when we're going to need to rev up to get through a rough time, and if, not if, and when we submit ourselves and fully trust and lean into the plan that God has for us as individuals, as a church, then God will provide all that's needed. That bedrock belief, that promise we've embraced, says that if we will let God lead us, that God will do new things, extraordinary things, unheard of things, things that nobody can imagine, that God will even turn darkness into light before our very eyes, that God will make rugged places into plains, will level things out, that God will do amazing and awesome things. We've seen some of those things get done around here, haven't we? Amen. But understand this, God does it God's way, in God's time. You know, I love the narrative about how God raised up Moses to lead God's people out of the slavery in Egypt. And when we were in our wilderness exile back in the chapel in 2007, our theme that year was Manna from Heaven in 2007. 
because we really perceived that um, unless resources fell from heaven, uh, we were probably going to be, you know, stuck in the back acreage forever, and, and that was not exactly desirable. But I really wanted, and, and we talked a lot about this narrative at that time, that you know, here are Moses and, and the people um, out in the desert, and, and it's time for them to move on. You know, they've, they've paid their dues. It's time to, to mobilize and, and, and go possess the promised land. But here are conservatively two, three, maybe even four million people. I mean, this wasn't just a little ragtag group of 60 or 70 like us. Those people had to be fed. The quartermaster general of the army reported that in order to feed those people, they have to have 1,500 tons of food each day. Now, now think about that. 1,500 tons. Uh, Mercy can correct me if I'm wrong here. I was reading the Chaps Avenue report, and I was really impressed last year. The post office gave them 4,500 pounds of food. Now, that's pretty impressive. But think about 1,500 tons of food each day, and that would take two freight trains a mile long just to bring their food. I'll think about it, they're out in the desert, so they're going to have to have some firewood, so they're going to need 4,000 tons of wood on freight trains, so a mile long uh, freight trains, they would have to have water, so 11 million gallons a day just to drink and do a few dishes. Oh, and another thing, the Red Sea. If they were on a narrow path, which is what we see um, in Hollywood, double file, the line would be 800 miles long, and it would have taken them 35 nights to cross over. So on the Red Sea, it was three miles wide so that they could walk 5,000 abreast. And there's another problem. Every time they camped at night, they needed a campground two-thirds the size of the state of Rhode Island. Can you imagine? Just for camping. Now, if I had been Moses, and sat down before I took on that task and started thinking about this stuff, I'd probably be sitting there, you know, still sitting there in Egypt, <laughs> eating the leeks and cucumbers, amen? <laughs> but there are, and there were skeptics then as they are now. I love the story about, a few years ago, about a man who uh, was doing a lecture tour, uh, mostly out west. It was important in Oregon, actually, when this happened talking about how believing the miracles of the Bible is kind of intellectually slothful. Like, oh, you know, come on. You really think that happened? And he was talking about the parting of the Red Sea, and, and he said, you know, uh, we, we have been able to seismographically prove that the Earth shifted on its axis at that particular time, and apart from any miracle, it created a sandbar at that particular time so that the people could march over three inches of water, no miracle of any kind. Back in the auditorium, a woman raises her hand and says, Praise God, it's a miracle! The man's a little shocked, and he was like, Madam, do you dispute my charts? And, no, I like the little errors, especially the blue ones. Then you'll admit there's substantial scientific evidence that far from any miracle, this is what happened. She said, I admit that. She said, but that's the miracle, don't you see it? God drowned the whole Egyptian army in three inches of water. <laughs> and by the way, historically, we know that because that particular pharaoh's missing. By the time they got through this and got to Jericho, to the Promised Land, you would have thought they would have been so excited about what God was doing for them that they had at that time accumulated on their rosary so many promises, so many miracles, so many amazing things that they'd be sitting on the edge of their chariot saying, what's next, God? No. We get like that sometimes, too. The torch is passed from Moses to Joshua. And they come to the first city of Jericho, a fortified city, a city that looks like, you know, the gates of hell couldn't prevail against it. And Joshua gives the marching orders. All right, folks, here's what I want you to do. 
Put on your vestments, march around the city once a day for six days, following the seven priests with seven trumpets before the ark. On the seventh day, I want you to march around seven times, and on the seventh time, I want you to blow the horns, and the wall of the city will fall flat. Got it? You want us to what? <laughs> now understand, this wasn't a little retaining wall. This wall was 30 feet high. Actually, there were two walls. And the outer one was 6 feet wide, and the inner one was 12, about 15 feet in between. And they built houses. That's where Rahab, the prostitute's house, was. And four chariots could run across. These are big walls. Verse 10 of Joshua 6, he puts a little caveat in there. He says, by the way, keep your gap shut. Well, that's a paraphrase. <laughs> no talking. You know why? Because when people are on the verge of being part of a miracle, of doing something really, really supernatural, the enemy likes to get them murmuring. I hear it sometimes. And when I hear it, I hate it, especially when it's coming out of my mouth. Amen? <laughs> Whoever, this is ridiculous. I feel like an idiot. What good is just walking around these walls going to do? Nobody in history has ever heard of doing anything like this. I think Joshua's been out in the sun too long. <laughs> this doesn't make any sense. The more it doesn't make sense to you, the bigger the miracle's going to be when it comes. You don't have to understand miracles. You don't have to be able to explain Miracles, just embrace them. Just trust. Just obey. Don't worry if people will think you're nuts. You know, this church was three months old when we came to look at this property, which was on the market for half a million dollars. We weren't even incorporated. And people thought we were crazy. Bunch of crazy queers. <laughs> well, of course, then we lose our, our, our building to the mole. So what do we do? Decide to rebuild in the worst economy since the Depression. <laughs> and people are like, they'll never get that building done. Well, here we are. Amen. You either believe or you miss out. And when I say believe, I'm not talking about intellectual assent. I'm not talking about just agreeing and going along with it to be a good sport. I'm talking about staking the farm. I'm talking about no plan B. I'm talking about stretching your neck out so that if God doesn't come through, you're in deep, deep doo-doo. We have too many wait-and-see believers. Well, I'm just going to hang back a little bit and Check out and see how it goes. No. You step in. You invest before the outcome is known. You take the plunge. It's an old story of a mountain climber. and He's way high up. And loses his footing. Falling down. And he, he grabs a hole of a branch. Protruding on the side. And as he grips with all of his might, he, he hears a voice. And he calls out, God, is that you? Yes, my son. You thought God had a booming voice, didn't you? <laughs> I used to, too. But sometimes God lists, yes, my son. <laughs> Please, help me. I'm losing my grip. Don't worry, my child. Let go. Three, four hundred feet, raging river, more rocks. Is there anybody else up there? <laughs> <laughs> there may be some areas in your life this morning that are sort of out of focus or unclear, off track. Places that there's just some uneasiness or struggle in. The great and awesome God who knows 
every word you're about to say before it comes up on your lips. Who knows your thoughts, your intimate thoughts from afar. The God who was there when you were being carefully knit together in your mother's womb. Here's what God says to you this morning. Let me move in. Let me move into your life. Sure, I'm going to rearrange a few things. But if you will hand me the GPS to your life, God says, I'll show you transformation you can't even believe. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us.